Lord, I'm so grateful to you. You always come through for us, Lord. Whatever we need, <clears throat> you supply all of our needs. And I appreciate that so much. It's just a wonderful, wonderful characteristic you have of being sufficient, all sufficient. Isn't it, David? Amen. He comes through every time for us. He's a good, good, good God. Lord, we want your presence. There's nothing in the, in the whole world like your presence. And you, can, you accomplish so much, Lord, with your presence, just with your presence. And we're so, uh, we understand that, and we're so grateful. Uh, the lesson today is about works of the flesh, which are dead works. You know, we, we're always busy working, you know, working here and working there. It's hard to realize that some of these works can be dead works. If they're not lead works, they're dead <laughs> works. <laughs> they have to be led by the Lord. 1 Corinthians 9.27, Paul says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. We can work busy like little ants and disqualify ourselves and it end up being not worth anything. That's what we're gonna talk about. What kind of works do we have? Paul is saying that the human spirit had to bring his body into subjection. He's not saying here that he had to bring his born-again spirit into subjection, but that the spirit man on the inside, the inside man, had to bring his body into subjection because we can disqualify ourselves in the race of life by operating in the flesh instead of in the spirit. I don't want to waste my time like that or my energy. One of the major areas where believers unknowingly give Satan access to their lives in not obeying this scripture, either because, well, maybe they haven't been taught correctly we can be mistaught or have a misconception about teaching, the teaching. Or because we've listened to our flesh instead of our spirit. I think that's more common, to listen to your flesh instead of your spirit. Satan gets a foothold in people's lives when they allow their bodies or flesh to dominate them instead of allowing their recreated spirits to rule and dominate the flesh. The body is to be subject, subject or under the domination of your spirit. This means that you don't allow your body to do anything it wants to do. Which part of you is the most likely to do the Lord's will? Your body or your, your spirit. recreated spirit. Yeah. Re your recreated. spirit is closer to the Lord. Yeah, it is. And the born again, newly created spirit is more obedient than the unredeemed or even a redeemed body. Sure. Still, you need to go by your spirit and not by your body. Why, why do you suppose that is? God is spirit, and mm -hmm. those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in mm -hmm. truth. Yeah. A spirit is higher than flesh, isn't it? Spirit is, is stronger and yeah. more real, more true. More spiritual. Uh -huh. It's more powerful. I think, in the body. The unregenerated soul 
has to be renewed daily by the washing of the word. That's what the Bible says. Daily. I used to, I didn't used to do it daily, but I have for a long time now because I wouldn't want to go a whole day without really touching base with the Lord and seeing oh, what, yeah. he, you can, what he yeah, had for that. us. You just can't you can't neglect that. The word washes you and cleanses you from all unrighteousness. The word the forgiveness cleanses you from all unrighteousness and renews your renews renews your mind makes it fresh and more powerful. If Paul had to discipline his body and force it to do what it was supposed to do, that means that Paul, Paul's body, wanted to do wrong things. So did mine. So did mine. When you were born again, your inward man be became God's when you were born again. But you have to you have to work at it to get your body and your soul to go along with your spirit. Don't you? Mm -hmm. It's not easy either. Your inward man is is the stronger of the two. And your outward man, you have to keep working on it, keep urging it, and teaching it, and reteaching, and renewing it. It it calls it a reasonable sacrifice. I thought that was interesting. Why did he call that a reasonable sacrifice? Compared to what God did. That's right. Exactly. I mean, whoa. Wow, what he did. It's amazing what he did. He he pulled, he raised us up. He made us better than we were. He made us like God. That is, a, that is so amazing that he could make man out of dirt and then put himself into him. And it is a reasonable sacrifice to give your life back to him. We owe him everything. And we don't realize how much, how much he's done for us, but we will one day. One day we will realize, we will see it clearly, what he has done for us. And we will be so delighted with it. I, I, I get a glimpse of it regularly, you know, how, how delightful it is what he's done for us. Amen. Romans 12, 1 calls it our reasonable service. And yes, yes, that's what it is. It's our reasonable service. We don't owe him. It's, he's not asking too much of us. No. It's reasonable. Paul is telling them that although they have a brand new spirit, it's up to them to keep their body and soul under subjection. Keeping your body under subjection to your recreated spirit is a major defense against Satan, and it is a reasonable sacrifice. The very fact that it's called a sacrifice means that it's not an easy thing. True. It's big, big, big. We, don't, we just can't conceive of how big it is. In James 4, 7, the Bible says, Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The devil is, is our formidable enemy. Mm -hmm. He wants to, he is really our enemy. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy from us. He hates us. He hates us. I can, I, I can think of more, lots of reasons why he would. In the first place, 
He wanted so badly to rule. He wanted power. And God did create him to rule. God created a man, made a new man, and created him and said when he created him that you will rule. That made Satan so mad. You know, we have to accept where God puts us. Don't we? Well, if you don't, what you're doing is you're saying, I'm in charge. And you're not in charge. No, you're not. You're not a man. Satan was never meant to govern man. Hmm. Never meant for that. He could he could play music until he got to be so evil, till he sinned. He could play music and he could he could bring worship to the Lord. That's that's a wonderful thing. And that's what he was created for. That's he was suited for that. He was beautiful. He was suited for that. But no, he, he didn't want that. That's not what he wanted. He wanted to be the main, main one and be the big one. Instead of leading worship towards God, he yeah. wanted to be worshipped. He wanted them to worship him. Um, <clears throat> when you submit your body to God and do not allow it to do the things that are wrong, you have a whole lot easier time with Satan. Mm -hmm. You know, Satan now has sinned. He's already ruined himself. He's been judged. And when you submit your body to God and do not allow it to do things that are wrong, you can deal with Satan and you have to deal with him. He is a terrible enemy, <coughs> evil very evil. God knows that without submitted bodies and transformed minds, believe, believers will not be able to follow the leading of the Holy <coughs> Spirit. They won't be able to. Man thinks he's so strong and we realize all the good gifts that God has given us. But without him, we're no match for Satan except that God is in us. Ooh, that's a, that's a changer. Mm -hmm. I'm not so big a deal until God's in me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah. We could not follow the Holy Spirit if God had not put of himself in us, of himself. Mm -hmm. Romans eight fourteen says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The sons of God are led by the Spirit of God. They are the sons of God. It does not say, for as many as are led by the five physical senses are the sons of God. Or as many as are led by your feelings or emotions or even what you reason out of your mind. We think we're so smart sometimes because we've been able, God has put, he's just put of himself in us. He has all knowledge. He has all wisdom. And he, he gives us as much as we will take of it. But it's of him. It's where it, where it is of. If we don't get our mind renewed with the word of God, it will side in with your body. We need constant fellowship and infilling of God. I wondered, I wondered, and things went through my mind in the past, of um, God doesn't just turn us loose with the world. He, he gives us the responsibility, but he is in us. And he has to be prayed to and consulted and honored. Mm -hmm. It has to work that way.
That's the way it's designed. That's the only way it's going to work. And if we don't renew our minds, then our mind will just side in with Satan, with our, actually with what we want yeah. and what we desire. Which, which is influenced by Satan. Yeah, it is. I'll be glad when he's out, put out of the picture, because he really tries to make us well, do he's, wrong. he's already been sentenced. Yeah, he has. He has the sentence, and he knows it. Yeah. When you think about the plan that God had, it blows my mind. It's so magnificent. Nothing else would have worked. He knew just how to do it. You know, you can't blame the devil for everything. You know, oh, the devil made me do it, you know. You can't blame the devil for carnality. That's your own choice. You can be, you have the tools to overcome and you have the tools to be successful in your Christian life. Mm -hmm. Carnal signifies the flesh that is sensual, controlled by your senses, by your animal appetites, your belly, what you want to eat, what you have to eat, what you like. It's governed by human nature instead of the Spirit of God. And we, we must not be governed by our senses. We just, we just don't, that's not what we want. That's not God's plan. We must walk by faith in God's Word and be led by the Spirit of God, which is the Holy Spirit. A person can have all the gifts of the Spirit and still be carnal, still make decisions that glorify himself, make decisions that make him look good. We need constant relationship with God to be successful like he wants us to. And we, we must be under the domination of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. It will work that way. Yes. It's a very dangerous way to live if you don't, because the Word says that you can actually be born again but then, be, then become an embarrassment to the cross. Bring shame to your Lord. We don't want to do that. No, I don't. I really don't. The Christians in the Corinthian church were like that. The Corinthian church had a hard time. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 to 3. They were babies in Christ. And what? How did they? How do we know they were babies in Christ? Because hmm? the Bible says so. Just keep reading. They allowed their five senses to dominate them. What they ate, what they wore, rather than the Holy Spirit. And then he he gives us uh, something we can look at, and that will show us it when we are carnal when we're behaving carnally. It says, ye are yet carnal, for where there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal? And walk as mere natural men. Mm -hmm. You can be God-filled with all of these wonderful gifts that he's given us and still walk as mere men mere men. That impressed me when I read that. He said that where, if there's envying and strife and divisions, that you're carnal, you're not walking in the Spirit, and you walk as mere men. James 3.16 says, where envying and strife is, where envying and strife is, 
There is confusion in every evil work. Not just a few evil, little bit of evil, but every evil work is there. And you can tell by the envying and strife. We need to watch envying in ourselves. And it, it shows its ugly head every once in a while, you know. Maybe you don't, maybe not to you, but to nearly everybody I know. And I have to, I watch for it. I couldn't believe that you looked at me when you said that. <laughs> I, look, I look at you all the time. <laughs> for where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. This tells the world that we are spiritual babies. I don't want, I need, we need, so that's why we need to watch it. Mm -hmm. We need to watch for that, for envying and strife. You know churches have the, some of this in, in them most of the time, don't they? Have you ever seen it in a church? I have. But what do we, huh? Uh-huh. What is it that mature Christians should be doing? You can be a mature Christian or you can be a baby in Christ. Mature Christians, what do they do? They pray for each other, for one thing. I, I, have, I have so many people I pray for, and I know you, you and David do. Don't we, David? We have many people we pray for. <coughs> We have to forgive each other, too. Forgiveness is a big part of it. Forgiveness is so important. Very, very important. That right. tells you if you're a mature Christian or if you're a baby in Christ. Mature Christians try to build each other up. And mm -hmm. immature Christians try to compete with each other try to show up to be really impressive, you know. And they like to tell how much they know. And they like to, they, but mature Christians build each other up. Do you try to build up your Christian brother? We should. That shows a, a sign of maturity. What are, what are some other things that a mature Christian would do? Seek the presence. If he's smart, he will seek the presence all the time. Yeah. And, and be sensitive to the presence when he's in decision-making. If he's in a decision-making situation, he needs to hear from the Lord. Yes, he does. He's not all wise all the time. No, no. Love, love each other, not so. That's right. Yes. Love goes so far in uh, being mature. It really does. And he, he, a mature Christian pays great attention to where he walks, where he places himself. I have, I have friends that I love, Christian friends, and they just get themselves in the worst messes because they walk in the wrong places. They put their bodies in the wrong places. And that's, that's your decision, where you put yourself. And if you put yourself in a, in a situation that you should know is dangerous for you, you're, just, you're not being mature at all. You're being a child. And we have to watch our flesh all the time. Did you know that? We have to watch it. We have to watch if we're envious of somebody. Or watch, watch if we're being selfish. I remember I had two older sisters. I had three older sisters, four. <laughs> we had a big family. And I had one sister, she watched me like a hawk. And she'd say, now you're being greedy. She called it greedy. She always, she's told me a hundred times that I was being greedy. 
So I watched it. It sounded like such an ugly word. You know, greed. It's an ugly attitude. It is. It greed is <coughs> idolatry. And and we sure don't want to get into that. But we have to watch our flesh and not so that we won't serve our own flesh. Serve what benefits us. We need to look at the other person there by, beside us and look at their needs and what they need and serve others. Self-serving is a, is a really dangerous thing, being self-serving. And you know, we never get it all. No matter how careful we are, we, we always find something, you know, that we need to do, need to improve on, need to uh, cut out or, or die to. You know what it means to die to something? The Bible talks about it quite a bit. You put, just put the desire of, uh, away. Yeah. I mean, I do away I, with it. Do away with it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I would, I think that perhaps the biggest area for this kind of problem is your thought life. Mm -hmm. Because you can think anything you want to, and if you're smart you'll know that some things are dangerous to pursue in your mind. Very dangerous. We have to close the door to Satan. Close it to him. We can't pursue that. We can't pursue what, what he wants us to do. We have to cleanse our minds and pursue what God says. Bible calls that closing the door to Satan in our thoughts sometimes. The mind has been called the gateway to the soul. Your mind is a very ingenious thing. God, God created it. And we need to control our thoughts. That will cause you, cause us to entertain thoughts that originate from the devil. We need, we need to notice where it comes from. And I've said this before, but I had a Bible school in college. In, yeah, it was college. And uh, she would say, when someone brought a thought, to, she'd get a thought, and she'd say, where'd that thought come from? Then she would say, that's not my thought. And then she would get a clue as to where it did come from. It came from Satan. Well, the next thing she asked was, is it from you, Lord? Yeah. Is it scriptural? Yeah. That's another way of asking that mm -hmm. question. I measure things by the, by the Bible all the oh, time. Yeah. You know, well, is this scriptural? I'm always doing that. Your body members are not dead. So we have to reckon our body dead. The Bible says to do that, to reckon your body dead. You just consider that your body's dead to this thing that, I, that you enjoy doing so much that's not good for you. You died to it, you may as well give it up. Give it up right then and there. Reckon our bodies dead to sin. in order to keep from serving sin. Because your body will want, want to keep right on serving sin if you let it. You will always have trouble in this area if you don't, do not learn to close the door to Satan in your thoughts. Satan will always try to enter a person, whether they're saved or unsaved, through his thoughts. He all, that's that's the pl usually the place where he tries to get in. And if he, he, he's persistent, he'll keep on and keep on and keep on.
and if you will, if you yield to it and listen to him, you might be caught doing the very things that you don't want to do and that are dangerous for you to do. You cannot keep those thoughts from coming, but you can keep them, you can keep from entertaining them. You know how in your thoughts you enter, you can entertain them and you can enjoy them <laughs> in your imagination. You know, you may not, you not, may not be uh, standing up in your body, but you're standing up in your mind, you know. You're, you're thinking nasty thoughts about something and that you don't want, that you're not supposed to do or something you want to say that you know you can't afford to say it, you know. We need to keep our very thought life clean and wholesome. You, you really can't control who comes to your front door, but you have something to say about who you invite into your house. Thoughts will come into your mind, and they may persist. But thoughts that are not entertained or put into action will die unborn. Satan will not have anything to work with when you successfully resist these thoughts. You know which one, we know which one, ones are dangerous to us. We know which ones to resist. You can choose what you allow your mind to dwell on. The devil can get access to your soul through a book, a television program, or just thoughts that you entertain. And you're responsible for what you entertain in your mind, what you think about. These thoughts are poison to your mind. Ask the Holy Spirit to give you discernment in these areas so you will know what is going on in the spirit. If you entertain evil thoughts from the devil, more than likely you will eventually yield to the action. And where there is perversion, you can be sure an evil spirit is involved. I can almost say with certainty that every evil deed begins with the thought entertained in the mind. I think so. Mm -hmm. An evil spirit may come into a person who continues to sin. You don't want to you, you you don't want to entertain sin in your body, you know, and keep doing things that you know are wrong. Keep on. If uh, alcohol is a problem to you and you. You like the feeling you get when you drink it because you can do what you want to do and you don't feel bad about it. If a person continues to sin, he can be set free from that. If you don't get free from those things, they'll get, they'll get a stronghold in you. If you keep doing wrong things over and over and over, they'll get too strong for you and you won't be able to set yourself free and then you have to get someone to pray with you or pray for you. But you can be set free. It's so powerful and so thoughtful of the Lord to provide for that. A way to set you free from the grips of sin. How do you do it? How do you get free from habits or strongholds? <clears throat> well, the first thing is refusing to think about them. Mm -hmm. Don't indulge yourself with it. Yeah. Uh, I, I've, I've cast out a lot of evil spirits in my life. Yes. You have since I've been with you. Mm -hmm. A long time. Yeah. How do you how do you pray about something like that? The best approach is to ask 
for the power of the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. <coughs> now that has been given to you. You have been given, given the position of an agent of Jesus Christ. So you have the power of his name. Mm -hmm. So when you tell Satan to get out of a person or a place, he recognizes the authority based on Jesus talking to him. And he'll leave. He will. It's amazing how he does that. I mean, he, he, he takes it seriously. He very seriously. I don't know what God does to him when he doesn't, but I know he, he takes it seriously. He does what God says that he will do. If God says that you can cast him out and you do, what, do it the way God says, he has to go. He has no choice. He's afraid not to. I have seen the fear in demons that I have cast out. I had a, my sister, one of my sisters, didn't really believe that demons got in people. I mean, she took it very lightly. I hope she learned to do it, take care of it before she died, but she had, a, she, her little boy came in one day and said, Mama, there's, there's something trying to get in the window. And the kid saw it. He said, there's something trying to get in the window. And he was scared. And she said, well, tell it to go away. And he said, okay. And that little kid told it to go away, and it, it did. It obeyed that child. So, and we also, we need to repent of allowing the demon to come in in the first place. We sinned, probably, to allow him to allow that thing to get started whatever the deed was but you need to repent of whatever you did to allow the, a demon to come in repent and then command it to leave and then it has to obey you you know you can't go against a person's will If they don't want the evil spirits to go, you, you're going to have a hard time making him go. He knows when. He knows. If a person wants to keep that evil spirit, he's very difficult to deliver. I've seen cases, and you have too, where the person who had the demon in them did not want them to go. And that's where the deliverance stopped. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, uh, I, I, I had understanding of why that person, this particular person that I'm thinking about, didn't want that demon to go. I thought, why wouldn't he want them to go? They're ugly and they're, they're harmful. You know, why wouldn't he want them to go? But that demon gave them a certain amount. He had a certain amount of power through that demon. It's really funny how that worked. He enjoyed that. He liked the power that he got from it. But uh, if you get under their power, you know, if you get a strong, if they get a stronghold in you, you can't even do it by yourself many times. But uh, you, you do have the power to get out from under it. Yeah. If you keep praying about it, God will come to your rescue. And you may need some help. And you don't want to reopen the door either. You don't want to go back to something and start doing bad habits again. You just uh, better be thankful that you got out of it. Do you know how to speak in tongues? Yes. Me too. I do it a lot. I do too. Uh, I know a lot of people that don't believe in that. And my church that I used to go to, 
then they preached against it. But I saw a power in these people that spoke in tongues. And I saw what it would do for them if, when they spoke in tongues. And I, so I decided that I needed to do that. And it was difficult for me to do it because I'd been taught that it wasn't of God. But when I, I finally decided that is needed, and it is of God, and it's true, that this gives you power. What does the host, what does speaking in tongues do for you, David? Different than what? What does it do for you when you speak in tongues? <clears throat> when you're speaking in tongues, you are speaking to God. Not people, God. Mm -hmm. And you're not speaking English or German or a known language, but rather you are speaking a vocabulary generated by the Holy Spirit, which is a vocabulary that Satan cannot understand. So this is a way to get around Satan in prayer. Mm -hmm. That's one of the big things that's yeah. good about it. It also builds you up. Yes, it does. And you know we all need to be built up. And it says we, that it keeps you. Keeps you built up if you'll keep doing it. Christians do a lot of talking about spiritual warfare. But the biggest warfare in the Christian life is between the flesh and the spirit. That's where we fight our biggest war. Yes, we have to deal with the spiritual forces of darkness, but if you get this war between your flesh and your spirit settled, Satan doesn't bother you nearly as much. He will never give up, but he, he doesn't have the power if you keep it, if you keep, keep hold of your own body, keep in control of your body. Know what the Word says and know how to use it, how to speak it. You don't leave doors open to your enemy. You need to understand the conflict between the flesh and the recreated human spirit and how to crucify the flesh so that you can possess your vessel. I, I read that in the Bible. So that you can possess your vessel in sanctification and honor. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 4, 3, 4, and 7 talks to you about that. It's good to read it. In Colossians 3, 5 through 7, the word tells us to put on, put the things to death with the warning in verse 6. Which things are you supposed to consider them dead in your body? Well, the way you do that is you look at the scripture. Yes. Gosh. <clears throat> In verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Okay. Okay. Is that Colossians verse, 3, 5 through 7? No, that's First Thessalonians. That's where we... Okay. Oh, that. Yeah, we, I have Colossians 3, 5 through 7. Okay. Excuse me. Especially verse 6. This is something we ourselves are to do, and he has amply supplied us with the power to do this if we will keep renewing our minds with the Word of God. 
the Word says something, we need to read it and read it over and over and use it. It makes us strong. We can use it. Therefore, consider the enemies of your earthly body as dead to immorality. Consider your bodies. You don't have the right to do that anymore. You don't allow yourself to commit immorality anymore. That's dead to you. No, you're, you're not going to be tempted. You're dead to it. You've, you've given that up. It says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality. A lot of people keep getting in trouble about immorality, and they, you've got to conquer that. You can't allow that. That's a no-no. You just yes. don't allow it. So consider the members of your earthly body as dead to it. Say it. Impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. It makes God angry when you do those things. And in them, you also once walked. He's, he's saying, don't be self-righteous about it because you once walked in those things also. When you're, you walk in them, you walked in them once, but now you put them all aside. And here are some of the things that you really need to put aside and don't mess around with it anymore. Consider yourself dead to it. And here's what they are. Some of them are. Anger. You don't have the right to, to blow off in anger anymore. You know what I mean? I mean, you're dead to that. That's mm -hmm. over with. You're not allowed that anymore. Malice. What is malice? I think, I think malice is when you have something against somebody and go after them. I'm not sure. What do you think it is? Well, I, w I would agree with that. Slander. <clears throat> we, don't, we don't slander people anymore, do we? No. Mm. No, we don't. Abusive speech from your mouth. I know people who speak abusive speech to their family members. And to their spouse. Yeah. <clears throat> you walk by their house sometimes and you hear them quarreling and you think, ooh, that couldn't be, and you're appalled by it. Yep. Do not, and what about lying? We don't get to lie anymore, y'all. <laughs> we don't lie anymore. The Bible says God hates it. Yep. So that's another one that we have to lay it aside. Since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the Im image of the one who created him. But we're dead to these things. We don't do these things anymore. If you aren't dead to them, you better die to them. You don't, you're not allowed that anymore. Then in verse 12 through 17, he tells us what to put on. Just like you die to those things and take them off, there are some things that you can put on. And you do it deliberately. You, you can verbalize it. You can say, well, I am going to put this on. The, here are some things that you can put on. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion. Put on kindness. Put on humility, gentleness, and patience. Bearing with one another and forgiving one another whoever has a complaint against anyone just as the Lord forgave you. We can't hold a grudge. We can't keep unforgiveness anymore. That's the past. 
we put it, we take it off, we give it up. So also should you. Beyond, beyond all of these things that we just mentioned, put on love. You may as well go ahead and do that. Put on love. Whatever it takes. You shouldn't have a person that you hate. Even if they do wrong, if they're unkind and rude, you have to take, you have to forgive. It said, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And the Bible speaks over and over about the power in unity. Having enemies and not cooperating with each other is not the most powerful thing you can do. If you want to live a strong, powerful life, you forgive others. Amen. And you put on these things and take off these things that it tells you to take off. Isn't it amazing that you can even put it on and take it off? It you is. can do it. That's a powerful tool to mm -hmm. do it. Purpose to do it. If there's something that is bugging you, that you have trouble getting rid of and it's always getting you in trouble, say, I'm going to put that off, take that off. I'm not going to allow myself to do that anymore. God will help you. He'll strengthen you with more power than you need. Lord, we're thankful that you help us to do these things. You've told us how to get rid of these things and how to live in a, in a way that we're strong and we can do the things that we want to do that bring glory to you and that give us strength and power in our lives. If nothing else, in behalf of our children and our family, do these things. Purpose to do these things. And God will bless you so much, if you will. It's his idea to do it, to take off and to put on. It's his idea. It works. We, when God says it, it works. Yes, it does. God, you're so wonderful to us. We want to glorify your name and we want to be pleasing to you, Lord. Amen. We love you, Lord. You're the one that we choose to obey <laughs> and choose to live for. And we ask you to go with us all the time. Be with us. Help us to grow in Jesus' name. Amen.